Well, the Markham Royals had trouble shutting the door against North York last weekend, but all that meant was that the OT finish was that much more dramatic. Highlights coming up. This is the OJ Today. Welcome, everyone. We are absolutely jam-packed with highlights on today's show, including our first look this year at Trenton and Wellington, two of the Eastern Division's powerhouse squads. Also, Pickering Panthers play-by-play -play guru Alex Bloomfield will join me via Skype to discuss that ultra-competitive Northeast Conference. But first, let's get to the bar down game highlights. And the Wellington Dukes are cursed with playing in the most brutal division in Canadian Junior A hockey. The East is the group of death. When the last place team is rolling along with an 11-6 record, you know things are pretty cutthroat. The Dukes are currently sitting fourth in the division. And last week they took on a suddenly struggling Stouffville squad that's lost three straight games. OJ Highlights Now brought to you by Bar Down, official clothing supplier of the OJHL. And the Dukes had dropped three straight heading into this one, so they were hungry for a W, but it's Stouffville to draw first blood. First period, Breck McNall from a tough angle snipes it past Connor Rickman. One zip spirit. Second period was all Wellington, but Aaron Taylor, though, manages to come up with a dandy of a save right there, robbing Brent House. Uh, but then the Dukes start cranking it up. Taylor makes the original save here, but Mitchell Mendonca, Johnny on the spot to smack it home and not things up at one apiece. And then it's Wellington on the power play. Nick Mucci with the sweet pass to Braden Stortz who knocks it from in close. And the Dukes go up by a 2-1 count and they keep coming. Spirit can't clear it out. Keep your eye on Kyle Prendell charging at the net. The diving shot beats Taylor. Dukes go up 3-1. Third period now, Wellington up 4-1. Stouffville think they've got one back here. James Waldron banks at home. But hold on, the Dukes complained the net was off. Great work by our cameraman, Steve Mitchell of Genmark Media. It was actually pushed off by Rickman, though. No goal, tough break for the Spirits. Uh, at the end of the day, they needed a lot more than a single goal, though. 4-1 is the final. Balanced scoring by Wellington with four different players notching goals as they snap a three-game slide over the struggling Spirit. Oh, the Markham Royals have picked up right where they left off last year. The squad rolled to the North Division title a season ago, and despite losing some key players, haven't missed a beat. They're currently in a dogfight with Stouffville for top spot in the North, and they had a chance to pull ahead of their rivals if they could nab two points against North York on Sunday. First period was quiet, so we picked things up in the second. Rangers on the attack as Ross Krieger rings it off the bar from in close, but it does stay out. Uh, Royals break the ice late in the second. Riley St. Ange, don't blink, pow. The cannonading shot to quote the late great Danny Gallivan. One zip mark of third period. The Royals pad their lead on the PP team captain, Lucas Condotta, tips it in uh, out front. And the blue and white go up by a two nil count and look to be fully in control. North York responds though. Keegan Blasby was a beast on Sunday. Follows up a shot on Marcus Sameo, and the Rangers cut the lead in half to 2 1 as Sameo couldn't smother it. And five minutes later, off the draw, Blasby again victimizes Sameo, and North York knots it up, which set the stage for overtime. 3 34 in. St. Ange comes through. He was phenomenal for the Royals in this one. Outraces Adam Jackman, and that is the decider. Second of the contest for St. Ange to go along with an assist as well as Markham celebrates the game winner. And, and no doubt the Royals uh, would have liked to have shut the Rangers down when they had that two-goal lead, but they will take it any way they can get it as they move past Stouffville, perhaps temporarily though, uh, for first place in the North Division. That's a battle. Okay, the defending Buckland Cup champs, Trenton visiting Aurora, second period. Braden Lachance, one of the stops of the year so far on Michael Silveri. Stretching to deny the sure goal. Take another look. I think I tore something just watching Lachance do the split there. Beautiful. This one ended up being a huge shocker late in the frame. Cats on the PP. James Thompson wires it home. Tigers lead one zip. And they would carry that momentum into the third. 6.22 in, two on one. Melconian to Tyler Davis. What the heck was going on? Aurora up on the defending champs. Two zip. 
And then Trenton with the brutal giveaway. Melconian says thank you very much. And Aurora was pumped, obviously, as they pick up just their fourth win of the year. And it's against the Golden Hawks. Three Zip Tigers are final. And that will deliver a serious shot of confidence to the young squad eh, who have struggled mightily so far this year. A great team effort, though, to beat powerful Trenton. Okay, OJ Commitments. A few to tell you about Liam Morgan and Lucas Brayout, uh, both heading to the Union Dutchman next season. Uh, Morgan in 18-19 and Brayout the, uh, the season after that, actually, in 1920. Uh, Dylan and Ty Jackson, twins from St. Mike's, heading to Northeastern. And Jeff Clark, the D-man from Oakville, heading to St. Lawrence. Congrats to all. OJ Trivia, last week's winner, Adam Jenkins, knew that Patrick Kudlow was the OJHL Defenseman of the Year last year. He wins an OJ prize pack. Who will answer this week's question? What team was Trenton's Jerome DuPont head coach of in the QMJHL? Might have to do a little bit of digging for that one. First person with the correct answer. To Rick Morocco, that's R Morocco at the OJHL.ca wins an OJ prize pack. Welcome back. So the question is, what can the Trenton Golden Hawks possibly do for an encore? After capturing the Buckland Cup and advancing all the way to the RBC semifinals last year, the Hawks are once again bullying the OJ. They're perched at the top of the ultra-competitive East Division. And last weekend, they laid the smackdown on Stouffville. Well, Stouffville have had no problem scoring first this year. The problem is holding that lead and they get the advantage again early in this one. Jackson Savory rips it home and the Spirit go up one zip. Second frame though, all Trenton. Stouffville can't move Mac Lewis out front. He gets about three cracks at it here. Ooh, that's three cracks too many and the Hawks get on the board all tied up at one. Three minutes later, Trenton on the PP. Michael Silveri, too much time, too much space. Snaps it past Aaron Taylor, and it's 2-1 for the Golden Hawks. Late in the frame, Lewis nabs his second of the contest. Looks like a bit of a deflection off the spirit stick there. Uh, no matter, 3-1 for the Hawks. In the third, great effort by Michael Silveri here as he can't quite get the wraparound to go, but Lewis is there, and that's the hat trick for Lewis. Trenton fully in control up 4-1. The spirit would get one back as Brett McKinnell Jams home the rebound out front to cut the Trenton lead in half, but the Hawks put this baby to bed late in the period. Uh, empty netter to make it 5-2, and Trenton celebrates yet another victory as they just continue to roll right along over top of the competition. 5-2 your final. How's this for a stat? The Golden Hawks are, have a plus 83 goal differential, by far the best in the league, and the Dudley Hewitt Cup hosts are looking like they will once again be extremely tough to stop. Well, the Mississauga Chargers have had a rough go of things so far this year, currently sitting last in the South Division. But the Chargers remain a very dangerous squad. Now, they've knocked off two of the OJ's top dogs this season with wins over both Wellington and St. Mike's. So you can't sleep on the Chargers for even a second, as the Oakville Blades discovered on Saturday. The Mississauga may not have many wins, but they battle their butts off every game, and uh, they strike first. Max Routledge. Somehow gets this one to go, and uh, the Chargers take a one-zip lead on Rutledge's fourth tally of the campaign. Uh, Oakville would respond, though shorthanded, no less, two-on-one. Matt Hayami feeds Jack Ricketts, and both he and the puck end up in the cage, and it's a 1-1 hockey game. So many weapons on this Oakville squad. Team captain Jackson Bales sets up the uber-talented Jack Jeffers, who snipes it past Julian Simi. And the Blades take their first lead of the game. Uh, they go up 2-1. Second frame, the hit parade begins. Connor Loft laying the smackdown on Tyler Hillenbrand along the boards. Great hit. And then Oakville keeper Chris Elliott has to be on his toes to deny several Chargers chances from in close here. Mad scramble in the crease, but uh, Elliott would end up covering up the puck. More physical stuff as Daniel Jellick 
Stands up Kyle Lewis with a great open nice check right there. 17-22 win. Joseph Rupoli. This kid was impressive. 16-year-old rookie defenseman drafted by the Oshawa Generals. And some serious soft hands as you can see right there. So they entered the third tied at two. But Bryce Misley breaking hearts midway through the frame as he goes roof daddy with the backhand. And that would be the decider. Misley off the Vermont of the NCAA in a couple years. So smooth. That won the game. Kudos to Missy though. As mentioned, they may lose. But they'll leave a team black and blue in the process. Oakville nabs the two points to keep pace with St. Mike's in the south. Okay, Milton in Toronto to face the Pats. Thanks to our friends at Ocean Fog Productions for the great footage. Uh, Pats on fire in the first period. Steve Munochos opens the scoring to make it one zip. And then it's Jeff Joint backhanding it home to give the Pats a two-goal cushion at the 741 mark of the first and then they kept on coming solo effort by Brett Bannister holds off the defender and a bit of a softy past even sent this who was cheating off the post just a touch and then Gustin Anetta with the quick little backhander that surprises the keeper four zip pats after the first but Milton shows plenty of life in the second first Jeff Lindsay cuts the lead to three as he makes it 4-1 Toronto would make it 5-1, but look at the play by Thomas Maya here. And sweet finish afterwards by Justin Paul, batting it out of midair. Could they make it 4-3? Yes, they could. Maya squeezes it home past Tyler Fassel. Uh, and that is a sweet little backhander by Tyler to cut the lead to just one. Alas, the comeback was not to be. Dante Spagnuolo cleans up the garbage in front. Uh, to make it 5-3. Each team would add one more in the third, but the Patriots hold on for the 6-4 win. Toronto, looking good this year. New coach Mario Chiquillo has the team playing well, and they're currently a couple of games over the 500 mark. Okay, the NHL came out with their CSS watch list. Six players uh, from the OJ, three from Burlington alone. Very nice there, and two from Oakville as well, Kellenberger and Misley, uh, as well as Nick Campoli, the dynamic forward, from North York. Uh, congrats to all who are on the list. Okay, let's take a look at the OJ standings starting in the East. Trenton on top uh, with a six point bulge over Whitby and Coburg, who are both tied for second, followed by Wellington in fourth and Kingston in fifth. Uh, to the north, we move now. Markham overtakes first from Stouffville with a three point lead, followed by Newmarket, Lindsay, Aurora, and Pickering. Uh, to the south, St. Mike's. A very slim lead over second place, Oakville, followed by the Pats, North York Junior Canadians, and Mississauga. And in the West, Georgetown with a comfortable lead over second place, Burlington, followed by Buffalo, Orangeville, and Milton currently in last place. Our alumni update for this week, lots of stuff going on. Justin Cablemaster uh, named WCHA Rookie of the Week. Drake Kajula. Uh, makes his NHL debut with Edmonton. Way to go, Drake. Matt Hoover, AHC Rookie of the Week, and Matt Laredo, AHL Player of the Week. OJ players doing well. Uh, Daniel Levins named uh, NCAA First Star of the Week. Uh, Tim Kylich of Buffalo, Suniac Player of the Week. And Matt Lippa uh, was named ECAC West Player of the Week. Welcome back to the OJ Today. I'm joined now via Skype by the play-by-play -play guru of the Pickering Panthers. That would be Alex Bloomfield. Alex, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on, Alex. All right, you're welcome. Pleasure. You are, Pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. You are part of the interview, which is brought to you by Edge Again, uh, the portable manual and powered skate sharpeners. Visit edgeagain.com for more information. And yeah, Alex has mentioned you are the play-by-play -play guy for Pickering. Uh, so you would be the expert to talk about them. We're actually going to talk about the Northeast Conference today in general and touch on some other teams. But we're going to start with Pickering. It has been a tough year. I think that's sort of a, a, putting it lightly, isn't it? Uh, the guys uh, struggling in touch this year in many regards. But uh, just, just tell us about Pickering and maybe some of the ways they differ between this season and last season. Well, last season was... It was interesting. It was a tale of two seasons, really. Once you get to January, you get the ownership change, and really the whole, um, well, everything changed with the Pickering Panthers, from the logo to the the actual staff behind the scenes. There's a few that stayed on from the transition, but 
this was really a new start for this franchise. And no, for some who've been following Pickering for a while, that that's happened multiple times in the last uh, five years or so. Uh, but uh, this time it really feels a little bit more permanent. I mean, Steve Sardellis at the top of things, the director of hockey operations, and Andrew Moore staying on as GM. Uh, they got Dave DiMarinis on board. Um, and then it, they really started with local talent. And they, they cut some of those veteran guys. Um, they, they sent them away at the deadline last year. And then in the offseason, they brought back a lot of the younger guys. And they had a lot of new faces from the the Durham region, really. Right. And so that's where they're starting with those 98-99s. And, uh, yeah, it's been a struggle. I mean, it didn't help. They started 10 games on the road as well, away from Pickering Rec Complex with the renovations. Uh, so, yeah, it's been a it's been an uphill battle. <laughs> right. And um, a, a younger team this year, is that correct? A little bit younger than they were previously. And uh, goal scoring. Goal scoring, a big problem for them. I believe second lowest total in the OJ so far this year. Just talk about some of those struggles in putting the puck in the net. Yeah, it, you said it at the beginning that the struggles have been throughout the team. Their goaltender, though, throughout the season, Graham Schroff, came back. Uh, he was an AP last year, but he really played out the, the beginning in, in the winter, and he was a solid goalie from the start. So that, that gave them some stability at the back end. But, yeah, it was their goal scoring. They really let them down in a lot of those games early on. Um, some of those scores got really out of hand, so it didn't look like it was their goal scoring. But once they started to rein things in defensively, um, they started to lose these these one-goal games, especially when you're looking at those road games. Yeah, uh, yeah up front, I mean, Davis Tikin Katsumi has been a big player. Plus, he's really been the, the, the guy up front that's been drawing a lot of attention from scouts, um, from the OHL and from the NCAA. But uh, he's been that one plus point. And then in the last week or so, we've seen some guys start to come together, some lines starting to click. Because there's been a whole shuffle of injuries and suspensions. And so that was just mixing in with a whole new group yeah. trying to mesh and together. And the yeah. recent addition of Stephen Elliott as well from Whitby. Absolutely. I believe yeah. on a point last of game, week. which was great. Okay, so let's move on to some of the other teams we can cover. Uh, Trenton. Uh, once again, uh, looking like they're going to be the power in the Northeast. Uh, last year's OJ uh, Buckland Cup champions, uh, Jerome DuPont, has got them firing on all cylinders. It's a huge year for them, uh, hosting the Dudley Cup as well, the Dudley Hewitt Cup. Um, Trenton uh, just rocking the house once again. Talk about how they've played so far. Yeah, uh, Trenton, they're again, the opposite of Pickering. Their goal scoring was incredible, especially at the start of the season. Um, now, I will say this. In the last month with the Trenton Golden Hawks, you started to see that goal scoring start to slip away a little bit. Obviously, there's still some guys up front producing, and there was the week where Eastern Canada Cup was going on where you can't really look at those statistics because half their team was gone. Um, and you're talking the same with the Cobra Cougars. But of course. they're starting to come back to earth, I think, a little bit with that offense. And they've got to start to even things out because – as much as Trenton seems to be the odds-on favorite, I mean, they do have the dud this year, but don't forget about Coburg as well. We're going to talk about that coming up, I'm sure. But, I mean, the Trenton Golden Hawks, they don't have this walking away in a basket. I mean, they're a good team. they got a lot of weapons. But uh, I think there are some holes as well, and we started to see that in the last couple of weeks. Which leads me to my next point, which was just a discussion of the East Division in general, uh, yeah. which is, it's insane. It's it's absolutely ridiculous. From 1 to 5, all these teams are well above 500. Um, it's it's a dogfight every single night. I would put it out there that it's probably uh, the most competitive division from top to bottom in, uh, in any league, uh, Canadian Junior A-League across the country. Um, it's just uh, a game in, game out. Uh, it's been incredible so far this year. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the Wellington Dukes not getting a lot of attention. They're sort of the, and as well as the Whippy Fury, those two teams mixed in with Coburg and with Trenton. Um, I think that those two teams are really... The sleepers a little bit. They're not sleepers in the sense that they're really like way down the standings right now. They're right there. Uh, but a lot of teams are thinking those those teams that are hosting those big tournaments are going to yep. take those. But watch out for the Wellington Dukes. There's a real good veteran core there. Their goaltender Connor Rickman, I think, has been is maybe silently the best goalie in the OJHL Northeast. He's played I think all but 14 minutes this season already for the Dukes. Um, maybe a little bit overworked, but otherwise. Uh, some of these teams can take down those giants of Coburg, who has the RBC Cup this year, and, and Trenton with the Dudley. So, yeah, it's anyone's game. Kingston is the fifth team in the mix there. I have them in echelon down, and we're going to, yeah. I was going to say, well, because you just got your first uh, look at, you know, maybe not your first look, but we're getting our first look this week at Kingston uh, through the highlights that you were so kind to provide. Um, and uh, they dropped you guys 4-1 on Sunday. But uh, your, your impressions of Kingston so far was your uh, getting a look at them. 
I mean, Kingston's a team that, well, we've, we've seen it over the past decade, really. I think nine of the last ten years they've been in the Final Four, so they always find a way to make themselves competitive. Um, the Kingston Voyagers this year, I don't think they're a contender to take home uh, the, the Northeast. They're just going to bother some teams, and, you know, they might get a first-round upset. You never know, because, I mean, they're going to be probably matched up if they finish fifth in that OJHL East with first in the OJHL North, and that's an opportunity, I think, for a little bit of an upset in that first round. Uh, but, yeah. yeah, this Kingston team... Young and they don't have much as much of those front line offensive weapons as the other teams do. I was going to talk about the North a bit, and we've actually almost run out of time here, so we're going to have to do that in a couple of weeks when you come back. But uh, Aurora, um, as weak as they've been this year, pick up their fourth win of the year on the weekend, and that was over the Trenton Golden Hawks. So, like you said, Trenton maybe not rolling as much as they were before. It's going to be fascinating to watch uh, the rest of the way throughout the season, especially with that East Division pumping along the way it is. It's going to be fascinating to watch. Alex, thank you so much for being on, buddy. And we'll have you on again in a few weeks to uh, do another review. Thanks, bud. Hey, it was a pleasure to be here. All right, more of you today. Coming up in just a moment. Welcome back. Well, all good things must come to an end, but one had to wonder when exactly the end would come for Georgetown. Now, heading into last weekend, the Raiders were on an incredible 19-game unbeaten streak. In the process, racking up wins over the likes of League Powers, Coburg, St. Mike's, Oakville, and Wellington. So who would have guessed that after 19 games, the streak would end at the hands of the Orangeville Flyers? And the Raiders hadn't lost since all the way back on September 22nd against Whitby. Thanks to our good friends at JVI Sports for the footage. 4.51 in Hudson. Lambert goes to the net hard and opens the scoring for the Flyers to make it 1-0. Still in the first two-on-one -on -one break for the Flyers here. Rocco Adriachi bides his time, threads it to Ryan Barboza, and an upset was brewing. Barboza with the second of the campaign. It's 2-0 for Orangeville, and then... One of the best hits you'll see all year. Keep an eye on Barbosa right there. Unfortunately, said hit is on Andriachi as he creams his own teammate. Uh, Andriachi in a world of pain and needed some attention on the ice. Ruin Baden Horse the difference in this game. He saw more rubber than the 401 in rush hour. 51 shots, stopped most of them, and he got scoring support from his boys. Winston Sensenik out front tips it home. Don't adjust your set. The Flyers lead Georgetown 3-zip. It looked like a comeback was brewing in the third for the Raiders, though. Late in the frame, McJanet pokes it home out front, and the lead is cut to 3-1. A minute 39 later, Josh Dickinson showing good patience. Flicks it past Baden Horse, and hold on. The Raiders pull to within one. Could they keep the streak going? No. With the empty net, Zach Lyons puts it home. And that sealed it for the Flyers. Streak over. It only took nearly two months. So after 18 wins in a tie, the Raiders finally lose one. At least head coach Greg Walters can finally wash his lucky shirt, which he swore not to wash until they lost one. By all accounts, it was becoming a bit of a health hazard anyway. Okay, Kingston in town to take on Pickering. Pickering put up a good fight, but the Voyagers just too powerful. Rob Clerk opened the scoring at the 9.31 mark of the first. And then five minutes later off the scramble out front of the Pickering net here, Adam Kim will bank it home to put Kingston up to zip and they would add to it in the second on the power play. Kyle Halber uh, ripping it home, three nothing for the Voyagers. They'd make it four in the third, but the Cats would get one back and it's a beauty. Thomas Hernandez behind the back to David Cooksis who tickles the twine, take another look. That is a sweet little pass by Hernandez. 4-1 the final. Clerk with the deuce for Kingston. Cooks is the lone marker for Pickering. As mentioned earlier, the Panthers just 56 goals on the season so far. That's the second fewest in the entire league. Okay, one more for you. Our first look at Burlington this year. Uh, playing Milton. Matt Kenny on the breakaway early for the Cougars. Nice stop, though, by Jacob DiVincentis. Kenny would open the scoring at the 7-10 mark. Did you see it? The refs get together for a little discussion, trying to figure out what happened, and watch again. 
as we slow it down and the shot goes right through the mesh. Good catch by the officials there. Cougars go up one zip. Milton would reply though. Brad Lindsay nets it and where was the Burlington coverage there? He could have had a picnic out front of the net. It's 1-1. Still in the first, Milton caught scrambling in their own end. Noah Hippoletti Smith out front. Slams it home and the Cougars regain their slim advantage. Second frame, Ice Ox tie it again. Matt Bowman turns on the Jets, smokes it past the keeper, and once again, deadlocked, it's 2-2. Four minutes later, though, Philip Lagunov uh, cleans up the garbage out front here, and Burlington pulls ahead. It's 3-2. Two minutes after that, it's a weird one. The point shot comes in and gets deflected up and somehow makes, it way, makes its way into the net. Puck luck, sure, but uh, the Cougars will take it any way they can. Milton never says die, though. Just before the break, uh, tic-tac-toe passing. Bowman finishing it off. That's his second of the game. The third looked like it was going to be dramatic, but Burlington took the wind out of Milton's sails. Lagging off to Chris Cobham, and that made it 5-3 Cougars. And then two minutes later, Matt Watson uh, with the sweet little move here as he splits the Milton D and beats the keeper. Paying the price as well, but the juice was worth the squeeze, as they say. 6-3 Burlington, your final. The Cougars needed those two points to keep pace with the Raiders in the West, where Georgetown is threatening to run away with the division with an eight-point bulge currently. Okay, let's take a look at the top five plays from the last week. Number five, Wellington's Kyle Prindell with the diving effort here that beats Stouffville's Aaron Taylor, part of a big Dukes win last week. Number four, Pickering's Thomas Hernandez with the gorgeous behind-the-back pass to David Cooksis, who shelves it. The only goal of the game for the Panthers against Kingston, but it was a doozy. Number three, Milton's Thomas Maya with the awesome move here, and then Justin Paul bats it out of midair for the score against the Toronto Patriots. Number two, and we're going to give Markham's Riley St. Ange two plays. First, the wicked one-timer. Hope you didn't blink. And then he turns on the Jets, uh, speeds away, and deposits for the overtime winner, giving the Royals two points against North York. And number one, Aurora's Braden Lachance against Trenton's Michael Silveri. As Joe Montezano said, that was utter larceny. Robs him with a beautiful glove hand, and that is our OJ play of the week. And that wraps it up for this week. Uh, just remember, though, to keep up to date on everything with the league, head to OJHL.ca. Uh, on Twitter, you can find it at OJHL Official, and, of course, on Facebook at Facebook.com slash OJHL Official. Thank you so much for tuning in, folks. We'll see you next week.